So hi, welcome to my talk, uh, Isotopic Modeling of Fluid Mixing in the Bushveld Complex and Subduction Zone Analogs. Um, some of you may have heard, heard some parts of the story previously um, from Alan Boudreau, so hopefully you don't mind hearing some parts again. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the concept of Bushveld fluid circulation primarily from an isotopic perspective. So I don't want to dwell too much on Bushveld geology here. Um, we've already heard some about it, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. But I do want to focus in on the extensive metamorphic aureole um, below the complex. There we go. Uh, so the extensive metamorphic aureole below the complex. Um, the aureole has an often been very emphasized in work on the Bushfield complex, but it does have important implications for the complex's formation. Um, this aureole is often quite thick, um, obviously formed during the emplacement of the complex uh, into the previously unmetamorphosed sedimentary rock. Um, and the model for Bushfield formation that I'm going to be discussing today uh, focuses on the injection of fluids into the crystallization, crystallizing main zone um, prior to the introduction of upper zone magmas to the complex. So going a little bit into the case for fluids here, the fluids that I'm talking about today would originate from the dehydration of the country rock. Um, and the figure on the slide, we see the progressive loss of H2O um, in a pelite undergoing prograde metamorphism as a function of temperature at three kilobars pressure. Um, sediments in Bushveld uh, were previously unmetamorphosed, so they had about three weight percent H2O available. And at Bushveld temperatures, um, 700 to 500, um, this region right here, um, that fluid would have been able to have been liberated during emplacement by metamorphism. And based on the thickness of the aureole, the amount of fluid generated from this contact dehydration would have been the equivalent to a body of water 90 meters thick per kilometer of rock dehydrated. Um, and so we want to investigate the evidence for this fluid having at least in part migrated into the Bushveld complex, um, which hasn't really been thoroughly considered outside of minor, minor local occurrences. So there are a few, features in the field that are suggestive of fluids that I'm going to discuss right now. First being the breccia pipe, which is located in the critical zone. Um, you can see it in large scale here in this figure labeled A. Um, and it's been interpreted to have formed by rapid upward movement of overpressured fluid. Um, in B down in this corner, we can see blocks that are brought up from the lower critical zone and the lower zone. Um, in general, the larger blocks are concentrated in the central part of the breccia pipe where the fluid velocity should be the highest, and they're aligned parallel to the axis of the pipe, which is consistent with rapid fluid-driven emplacement. A comparison to this pipe might be gas blowout pipes or that occur in sedimentary basins, which are on the scale of kilometers. Um, we also have a series of footwall upward dome and trough-like structures that have been mapped at Bushveld. Um, these structures have the ability to channel fluids into the upward regions. Um, previously, these structures have been suggested to be diapiric in nature. Um, that's basically related to density differences between the mafic complex and the underlying sedimentary rock that create instabilities in the sedimentary rock that lead to diapiric upwelling. Um, and these diapirs are most common in the eastern Bushveld, where it intruded a sedimentary sequence that had not previously been heated, so there was more fluid available to form these um, features. And what's shown on this slide is a cross-section example of one of those floor rock diapirs intruding uh, the, through the marginal zone, the lower zone, and the critical zone. And you can see the country rock outcropping there at the top. So last but not least, and the primary focus of, of what I'm going to be talking about today um, are, is the geochemical evidence for this, particularly isotopic variations. Major zones of the Bushville complex are characterized by distinct isotopic variations, both on a large scale and a small scale. Um, below the upper zone, isotopic disequilibrium is common within a single grain. Um, you have core rim variations and between different minerals. Um, then in the upper zone, isotopes are pretty consistent at the mineral scale and for bulk rock. Because the model we're discussing here involves the injection of fluids before the addition of upper zone magmas, the isotopic disequilibrium in the main zone and below and the relative consistency of isotopes in the upper zone would be expected in our model. Um, in this study, what we're basically doing is examining previously published Bushveld isotopic data um, to determine if the fluids released from Bushveld country rock could be responsible for the variations that we observe. So basically what we're showing here are previously, we're using previously published literature to create two component mixing diagrams that highlight the amount of fluid that's required to move the parental composition to a more main zone isotopic composition. Um, 
the elemental concentrations that we use for the fluid um, are based on a variety of fluid inclusion data and research on fluid mobilization, not just from Bushveld, but from a wide variety of different um, igneous area or intrusions and uh, morb and things like that, um, just in general to figure out what a fluid could scavenge from a sedimentary rock. Um, the isotopic signatures that we use for the fluid are based on measurements from the sedimentary rock around the complex. Um, because there's a little bit of uncertainty about what the fluid exactly would have looked like, we'll show a range of mixing lines for these, these systems um, to display the impact of minor compositional changes of the fluid on the, the model. Um, our parental magma assumptions vary depending on what data we actually have available. Um, we try to use the B3 sill or marginal zone data where possible, but sometimes we have to use uh, like a comatiate uh, as, the, as a parent when that data is just not there. Um, here we show strontium neodymium mixing. Um, again, B3 sill, our average main zone will always be this green color, and then our mixing lines going towards the fluid that's off this plot because otherwise it would be a little too small. And the primary thing that you can take away from this, the main zone range of isotopic compositions falls at roughly 1% fluid addition. Moving on to oxygen and hydrogen isotope mixing. Um, again, we're using a marginal zone data as the parent. Um, and the main zone, we have a, a wide range. And again, we're seeing sort of that one to 2% um, addition of fluid that can shift the isotopic signature of the parent to something approximating the range observed in main zone rocks. Um, one thing to note here, you, you may notice that what we've used as the parent, the, the oxygen isotope at about 6.8 is not exactly a mantle value. Um, probably that experienced some dry contamination prior to um, crystallizing. And we're not trying to suggest that the fluid is responsible for 100% of the contamination, just that it can contribute to shifting those isotopic compositions to what we observe. Okay, so here are a few additional systems. I know a lot of plots all at the same time. Um, lead, sulfur, and hafnium, and these systems get progressively more difficult to model effectively, mostly just due to a lack of data that's actually available. So I'll start by talking about lead. Um, lead contents in a Bushveld parental magma would be pretty low. Um, lead is fluid mobile, so your fluid will have a much higher concentration than that parental magma, and it can have a strong impact on isotopic ratios. Um, Lead mixing calculations are a little bit complicated because of uranium and lead mobility and because of radiogenic ingrowth. Um, so it's a little bit hard to know exactly what that uh, isotopic character of the fluid would have looked like so long ago. But what's clear in the mixing plot that we have in the upper left for lead is that the um, fluid presents a strong control on the lead isotopes in the complex because you only need a small amount of fluid much less than 1% to actually generate those main zone values. And again, that's just because of the relative concentrations of lead in the fluid versus the parental magma. If we look at sulfur, um, the parental values that we've used are approximately mantle. Um, vapor values, again, are based on isotopes that are measured in the sediments. And again, we see one to 2% of fluids can generate the S isotope values that we observe in the main zone. Um, and finally, hafnium. I'm sure some of you are thinking hafnium isn't mobile in fluids. Um, it, it does tend to primarily migrate in partial melt during partial melting, um, but some studies have suggested fluid hafnium or enrichment of a few hundred ppm can actually occur. And so we've used a low fluid concentration for our hafnium mixing plot, um, but we still see a shift from the parental hafnium, which is based on a comatiate, um, towards more crustal values and reaching Bushveld values at about uh, a little over 1%. You may be sensing a theme here. Um, what these plots are indicating in general is that adding one to two percent of a country fluid to the parental magma can pull the isotopic compositions of the parent towards what we're observing in main zone samples. Um, if we assume that the Bushveld Oriole generated three to six weight percent H2O, that only requires a third to a half of the fluid generated by dehydration to be added to the main zone, which leaves plenty of fluid to migrate away horizontally. Um, the table that you see here shows uh, parental magma um, with values where possible approximating the B3 sill or the marginal zone, um, then a sediment derived fluid, and then the effect of 1% fluid addition on each isotopic system, how much it actually shifts the, um, the isotopic values. Um, and we see that this fluid addition impacts different isotopic systems differently. Again, that pretty much comes down to the relative concentrations of the element in the fluid versus in the parental magma. If you have a higher concentration in the parental magma compared to the fluid, then the magma becomes less sensitive to fluid addition. 
Um, our results here are demonstrating a need for substantially less contamination compared to other contamination models, um, which have required as much as 30 to 50% of the main zone to be crustal in origin. Um, because the fluid preferentially incorporates a lot of these elements, the crustal fluid source requires significantly less addition of the same contaminant, the, the crustal contaminant. Um, and incorporation of such a large amount, 30 to 50% of contaminant, would require a very hot magma to thermally assimilate that material. Um, so perhaps a collaboration with a, with, of the main zone with a smaller amount of fluid um, is more reasonable given thermal constraints. So geochemically, uh, the model of country rock fluid circulation at Bushveld um, is viable. We've shown that one to two percent of fluid addition can shift towards those isotopic compositions. So I'm going to briefly move to some of the broader connections of our work, specifically um, to subduction zones, which isn't exactly uh, nickel or PGEs. Hopefully uh, it will be interesting anyway. So a lot of research has demonstrated the involvement of slab fluids in generating melting at subduction zones to create volcanic arcs. Um, What's less certain here are the physical processes by which those slab fluids actually migrate from the slab into the mantle. We can't observe it because of the depth at which it occurs and finding exhumed rock from that depth that hasn't experienced retrograde metamorphism um, can be difficult to impossible. So we're basically limited in understanding these processes by geophysical observations, lab experiments, um, and modeling. So it would be nice if we could find a way, an, a nice analog for this. And layered intrusions kind of have a similar geometry to subduction zones. You have the cold slab in a subduction zone or cold country rock um, in layered intrusions. It's then overlain by hot mantle or the incoming magma that formed the Bushfield complex in this case. Um, Bushfield complex, as I discussed early on, has evidence of diapirs that help to inject that fluid into the main zone. Um, and comparatively, one model for fluid migration into the mantle from subduction zones suggests the, gener the generation of mantle diapirs was responsible. And in both cases, those diapirs are uh, generated by instabilities because of density differences between the slab and the overriding mantle or the overriding um, magma. And so we have a similar process, similar geometry, and so large sills such as Bushveld may be able to act as proxies for the dehydration processes of subducting slabs um, and allow us to explore in the field how fluids can actually migrate into hotter rock. Um, so studying fluid influx at Bushveld um, may help to further understand the viability of the diapir model in subduction zones and whether that is a good model for how fluids move from the subducting slab into the mantle. So in conclusion, um, there is geologic and isotopic evidence for large scale fluid circulation at Bushveld. Um, the dehydration of country rock releases fluids that can alter the isotopic compositions of the Bushveld magmas to more main zone-like compositions um, with much less required fluid compared to the amount of crustal material that would need to be assimilated to achieve, achieve similar um, isotopic signatures. Um, and finally, as a broader connection, diapir formation at Bushveld um, has some similarities to diapir models for fluid migration and subduction zones, um, which may help us to better understand the physical processes that cause um, melting above subduction zones. So for more information about this, feel free to check out our paper that goes into more details about the isotopic modeling that we did, as well as more details about um, the subduction zone part, um, or feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you.